Hey crew, I've got the key to that 22 Audi R8 Performance Spider rear wheel drive, the full name. We are gonna take it for a drive, but first let's check it out. It looks on the inside and outside. This second generation R8 has been in production for a while now and the styling gets continually sharper as we go along. We've got these LED daytime running lights, LED projector headlights, functional quarter vents here, non-functional side vents there, partially functional front air dam, this one is painted in Suzuka gray metallic, and you're like, gray? Looks pretty white to me. Well, it's a very chalky white, and it goes great with the red painted accents and accentuates the creases on the hood. In profile, you get a standard set of 20-inch wheels wrapped in Michelin Pilot Sport Forest tires, 245 section front, and 305s at the rear. From within those wheels, you can see the optional red painted calipers. They're eight piston up front, clamping on those grooved and drilled rotors. V10 badges here, body color matching door mirror, and optional carbon fiber side blade that I wish was a little larger. There is more carbon fiber on the engine cover, yet another option. Look at that red leather interior. Stepping back to look at the profile, to me, the R8 in person does not look as big as it does in photos and videos. It's only nine inches longer than a TT's length. Doesn't take anything away from how good it looks in profile though. And getting to the back, I appreciate that the domed portion above the engine is not as bulging as the Porsche 911 Carrera Cabriolet at the rear. We have these LED tail lights, thin like the LED headlights, R8 badge, hidden and deploying rear spoiler, lots of honeycombing in the middle, and then a big black gloss diffuser down low and these optional sports exhaust cannon pipes out back. At the rear, the R8's letterbox look of the middle just emphasizes the width of the supercar. Overall, it is edgy, it is powerful. It's just a bit more compact than I thought. Let's check out the interior. Opening up and looking inside, at this express red leather interior. Looks fantastic with the exterior color. We have the optional diamond stitch full leather seats with gray contrast stitching, seat heating, power adjustments, including thigh extensions. With the premium package, we also get the Bang & Olufsen 13 speaker sound system. There's the two-tone black and red leather on the doors, one-touch windows, power adjusting and power folding door mirrors. Hit this button to open the front trunk where we find four cubic feet of space. It's not that much. I certainly couldn't fit inside it like I can the Porsche 911's frunk. RA tread plate here in aluminum, aluminum foot pedals. To get in, especially without the roof, I just put my hand here on the sill and then guide my butt down. Really easy to do. And also the leather on these seats, easy to slide over and in the bolsters, but when you're in the seat, they hold you snug in place. Look at that gloss carbon fiber there in the doors, around the gauge cluster, here in the center console. That's all an option package and looks fantastic. Put it in accessory mode, your start stop button here in the wheel along with all your drive settings. What you don't find on the wheel like you do in some supercars are your turn signals and your cruise control. Manual tilt and telescope, lots of it for the steering wheel. Then beyond the leather wrapped perforated cover, which is just the right thickness and size of that flat bottom, we find a 12.3 inch digital gauge cluster. Super sharp, high resolution, tons of reconfiguration here. And because it's the only screen in the car, there's no secondary infotainment, it houses all the media settings and your Apple CarPlay system. There is no head up display. You've got extended leather with the premium package, a rear wheel drive placard here, gloss carbon fiber around the air vents, your HVAC settings here. I love the design of these. Seat heating, slide this back for a wireless smartphone charging pad and two USB ports traction control, a slot for your key, a physical volume knob, perforated leather wrapping for the gear selector, and then this as a redundancy to control the screen if you don't want to use the buttons on the wheel. Press this down, counterintuitive, to raise the roof. And this process can be done at speeds up to 31 miles per hour and takes around 20 seconds. The ding means it's complete, and here at six feet tall, my head does clear the roof, if only barely. 
And I feel like there's more space and there's better visibility in this cabin than in the sister made to the car, the Lamborghini Huracan Evo Spider. Storage, not a lot of it, just a bit in here. You've got two cup holders, small door pockets, and a reasonable size uh, glove box. The two-tone black on red and the driver-focused design of this cabin, plus the gloss carbon fiber makes it look super performance-focused, and it gets me excited for the drive. All right, let's fire it up. That'll wake you up. And what's crazy about the R8 is that it goes from that boisterous startup to an idle no louder than a V6 Camaro. So drive modes will begin in comfort. Sounds appropriate for a convertible. And then we'll push forward into reverse. That brings up our backup camera here on the gauge cluster like everything in this car. And it's, uh, it's reasonably high resolution, not ultra clear. You do have trajectory lines, no bird's eye view, which would be nice. We're beginning with the top down. Windows up, including this back glass. That's not gonna be an exit. do the world famous horn test in just a moment like now quite well okay tops down let's factor that in but that's a pronounced horn it's the very end of the horn sound like a little little complaint there you wronged me sir I'm honking at you. Turn signal. A bit more gentle, subdued even. Powertrain, 5.2 liter, naturally aspirated V10, makes 562 horsepower and 406 pound-feet of torque. Those are increases of 30 horsepower and 8 pound-feet over the 21 R8 rear drive because for 22, this car is only offered as the performance rear drive. And that powertrain is mated to a 7-speed dual-clutch automatic gearbox. Shouldn't have to tell you, it's sending power to just the rear wheels. Now, comfort drive mode or really any of the drive modes are not gonna change all that much in this car because the rear drive version of the R8 is only riding on fixed dampers. So you don't have adaptive dampers like you do in the Quattro model, so the ride quality is not going to change. And so it stays modestly firm, but the hard hits are softened on their way from the road surface into the cabin such that this rides like a convertible should. And that is very nice. At 65, there's absolutely minimal wind buffeting going on here. Of course, you do have moving air inside the cabin, but it's not making that quap, 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 quap noise that can sometimes happen in convertibles. The seven speed loves to upshift in comfort or auto drive mode. And so we're chilling in the seventh gear, but it makes those transitions between the gears imperceptibly. Brake pedal very easy to modulate. Gradually work your way to a stop. See about that turning radius. Quite good, even without anything like rear wheel steering. <laughs> and even in comfort mode, 
when you get to about 5,000 RPM, the engine absolutely wakes up and it finds its voice with the active baffles and the exhaust. These seats are really comfortable, holding me snug in place, but not squeezing the life out of me. They're ergonomically shaped. The R8 is just wonderful to coast along in. And to jump back to the things that are changed up with the different drive modes, this one does have a variable ratio steering rack. And so based on drive mode and driving behavior, the ratio will change such that if you're driving in a performance situation where you won't need much lock to pivot the car, that's gonna close up that ratio. But at lower speeds, it will open up that ratio so it's a more gentle, more play in the wheel. Speaking of play, let's see how quick the R8 gets to 60. So I've got my race box set up here and I'm then going to activate the performance drive mode and from here to do launch control, you just hold your foot hard on the brake and pin the throttle. It will build up revs. Hold them at 35. Three 3.77 seconds to 60 miles per hour. That is dead on for what Audi estimates this car will do. And that's with noted loss of traction off the line. You heard that skid the tires trying to find grip and with a little bit of an uphill to start us off so I know we can do 0 to 60 quicker than that and that's quite good for a rear drive car I think we have to do it again so it's back into performance this time we're gonna have a little downhill slope after our initial start As promised, we did it quicker. 3.6 seconds to 60 that time. And what a noise this V10 makes. Holding it from 3500, already getting it ready to unleash all of the feeder on tap with an NAV10 at 5000 RPM, it sounds like this is the same engine as the Huracan Evo. Otherwise, this car is not nearly as shouty as its sister all over the rev range. The Huracan is just loud all over. Whereas in the R8, this engine needs to be elicited a little more. So let's go to dynamic, into manual. You can start to use the paddles on the back of the steering wheel and bring it to life. What a soundtrack! Listen to that! It sounds so exotic and so, so wonderful! Ah, oh, the pop of the overrun! And it goes like stick. We are on an uphill. And it's covering ground. Yeah. So quickly. I just want to live there. Right in that six to 8,000 RPM range, that is where I want to exist. Getting to string it out all the way to the 8,500 RPM red line is blissful. Honestly, the only thing bringing down the manual operation of this gearbox because the shifts are super quick is the fact that these paddles feel so dinky. There's just no satisfaction operating them. The travel is fine, but they're just this really cheap, rough plastic. And I would enjoy the fluidity and swiftness of the seven-speed dual clutch all the more if I had proper paddles like the Huracan. Should we have some gratuitous lift-off overrun? Oh. Yep. There it is. I'm a child, but I'm happy. You got 
not love the duality of a convertible supercar with a fantastic engine because you can make excellent noises. You can make excellent noises or you can easily just chill out and enjoy the wind around you and the sun on an actually sunny day warming the back of your neck like it, it's got the two purpose recipe just dialed in but even in places with wonderful weather you can't be top down all the time so let's put the top up and then raise the windows. Including the back glass. And take stock of how quiet Audi has made a fabric roofed convertible. Wind noise is not an issue. Little bit of road noise for sure and some tire noise. But where so many of these supercars are going hard top convertible roofs and, and really giving it that coupe experience or the convertible experience, Audi's stuck with the soft top and it hasn't appeared to be at the detriment of cabin insulation. White is cool, but I wanna see how the R8 brakes and handles as well. Good feel to the pedal. Turn in is sharp. You can get that rear end to come around. Smooth. This car is smooth at the limit. just gracefully brought that rear end around hard on the pedal it squirreled just a touch in the very beginning but the pedal stayed confident and thorough as I got deeper into it the steering had way more communication than I was honestly expecting because most Audi products really distill the feedback this dynamic rack is well sorted I mean the turn in was sharp and then the resistance through the electronic rack was enough feedback for me to know, okay, here's the limit, here's the limit of the rear tires. And then again, just, I mean, being able to coast the rear end around, pivot the car, meant that I didn't have to work that hard to get it to do what I wanted through the curve. Gosh, I'm impressed. I mean, I'm impressed with the ease at which the R8 rear-wheel drive does just about everything. It coasts along easily. I'm still in manual mode. There we go. <laughs> it coasts along easily and quietly with the top up. The cabin's well insulated with the top down. It cruises comfortably. It makes an incredible soundtrack when you want, which by the way, if you ever want to just drop the back glass. That V10, whenever you want. And then in handling situations, it when you get to the limit of the grip, it doesn't bite you. It just, it just nudges, it, it gracefully nudges. Now let's get into pricing and competition for the R8 Performance Spider Rear Wheel Drive. The starting figure is $162,000. That's 12 grand more than the rear drive coupe, but 50 grand less than the Quattro model that makes 602 horsepower. Now, the RA could be cross shopped with a variety of entry level supercars, but because we're talking about the rear drive and the Spider version, I'm going to keep it at under $200,000. Two cars come to mind immediately. We have the less expensive 
BMW M8 Competition Convertible. That's 139,000 to start. It makes 617 horsepower, gets to 60 in three seconds. The fuel economy is 17 combined. It weighs quite a bit more than the R8 Convertible. Performance, rear drive, and the top speed is less. The top speed for this car, I didn't share, is over 200 miles per hour. The top speed for that M8 is 189. It is all-wheel drive. It does have rear seats. So if both of those things matter to you, that's going to be one to consider. Then another all-wheel drive rear seat equipped vehicle is the Porsche 911 Turbo Cabriolet. Not the Turbo S, just the regular Turbo. That one starts at $189,000, which is the as-tested price of this R8 here. And the power is 572 horses. The 0 to 60 is 2.8 seconds. The fuel economy is 17 combined, just like the M8, just like this. Which would I choose? Well, I mean, if it was aesthetics alone, the R8 would win. If it was soundtrack alone, the R8 would win. And even if it was pricing alone, I think that a price a little more expensive than the M8 and less than the Porsche 911 Turbo Cab is well suited to what this car has on offer. It really doesn't have a weakness and I think it just brings so much to the table for your money. It's my choice in this segment. I hope you guys have enjoyed this POV drive review. And if you did, please like, comment, and share the video. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell to get notified. And I'll see you next time.